So just first of all, I'd like to thank Chloe, Nicole, and Rebecca from the um, from from the Development Trust and Human Relations just for organising the event tonight. And then I'm sure um, a number of you on the call will be very aware of Michael and Michael's knowledge with his various media appearances. But just to say a little bit about Michael more more generally, um, as well as as Chloe said, being the chair in Scottish politics at the University of Aberdeen, Michael's also the director of the Centre for Constitutional Change in Edinburgh. Um, he is also, amongst many other things, a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the British Academy. Um, he isn't just, as I'm sure people will be aware of with those media appearances, not just interested in Brexit, but also things to do with international European politics in general, um, territorial politics and also nationalism. Um, he has had an extremely um, successful career with over 100 academic publications. Um, just this year already, he's, he's been the editor of the Oxford Handbook of Scottish Politics. And next month, um, his new book, State, Nation in the UK, The Fractured Nation, will be published by Oxford University Press. Um, Michael has quite the um, knowledge on a number of things, and that's not just with those media appearances, but he's also given um, expert advice to, again, amongst others, the governments in Holyrood and also Westminster as, as well. So on a personal level, I always learn a lot or a great deal every time I speak to Michael, and I'm sure we all will as well tonight with his event um, and talk on Brexit, where are we now? So thank you again, Michael, for, for agreeing to do this. So thank you. Thanks for that, Mervyn. And it's great that so, so many of you could join us this evening. The last time I was talking to the Alumni Association, I realized was in June of 2019, three years after the Brexit vote, when we didn't know where we were going, we didn't know where we'd come from, there was a great deal of uncertainty, and I promised I'd come back again when it was all sorted out. So I'm back here, but it's not all sorted out because there's still a great deal of uncertainty about what exactly Brexit means. Certainly, there was an election in 2019, the Boris Johnson government came in, there was an agreement with the European Union about leaving the EU. We left the EU in February last year and at the end of 2020 finally the transition period came to an end. So in theory we were completely free of the European Union. However, as I'm going to argue, a lot of things have not been completed. There's certainly a lot of things to negotiate and this is going to be with us for a, a great deal of time yet. So there we have in the first uh, screen there, I'm not going to show you many slides or PowerPoints, just a few to set up the argument that I'm going to uh, deploy. There we have the Centre on Constitutional Change, which is the, uh, the centre. I've just retired as director of that, but if you want to know anything more about constitutional developments in the UK, Brexit, the prospect of an independence referendum, that's the place to go to there. Uh, the University of course the Economic and Social Research Council that has been sponsoring our uh, research. Now, I just want to show you, to start off with, two slides about what Brexit means, what the clear dividing lines are around this. The first slide there, it looks very busy, it's not very easy to read, but just want to make three points there. First, there's almost no gender difference in voting for Remain and voting for Leave across the UK. Secondly, there's a big generational difference amongst between Remain voters and Leave voters. So we have the youngest group voting Remain by 73% and the oldest group voting for Leave by 66%. That's probably the biggest difference between Remain and Leave voters. And at the bottom there, there's a social class difference a tendency for better off people to vote Remain, for people in the lower social and economic categories to vote Leave, but it's not a huge difference. In fact, the biggest difference, apart from age between Remain and Leave voters, is to do with education. But this is the slide that I really wanted to focus on, and I'll just explain what this means. Yellow are Remain voters, blue are leave voters and the question is here is what was the most important issue for you if you voted remain what was the most important issue and you can see there it's the economy that big yellow line on the top people who voted remain 
were concerned about the economic impact of Brexit. But if you look at the Leave voters, uh, then uh, people who are concerned with sovereignty were much more likely to vote for Leave. So you've got that big blue line there, uh, and then you've got a big blue line to do with immigration. In other words, people who voted to Leave were concerned about sovereignty, the take back control slogan, they were concerned to some degree with immigration and people who wanted to remain were concerned about the economy. And that is the fundamental dilemma within the Brexit process and it's trying to square these things. The need for economic access to Europe with its concern with sovereignty and taking back control that has made the whole thing so difficult and has left open many issues which have not yet been resolved and will still be worked out in, in future. Now that was put to the UK during the negotiations in this famous ladder. This is Barnier's ladder. Michel Barnier was the EU negotiator uh, facing up to the British government. And he said, well, look, here are the possibilities you can have for a future relationship with the EU uh, if you leave. Uh, you can be in the European Union as we were, uh, in which case you have complete access to the European internal market. There are no barriers, whatever, to trade. There is mutual recognition of goods and services. There's complete freedom of movement, good services, agriculture, people, freedom of movement of people, freedom of movement of investment. That's the deal under the European single market. If you go out of that, then for every move out of that, for every move you take away from European law and regulation, you'll lose some trading advantages. That's the trade-off. Now, the British government was very reluctant to face this, but this is really where we ended up. And so he said, well, look, you can have the European economic area. That's the Norway flag there. You can leave the EU, but you can stay in the single market. That is, you'll have free trade, uh, product standards will be recognized, your goods can circulate freely uh, and services within the European economic area, but you've got to accept the rules. You've got to accept our regulations and our product standards, not just product standards, but rules about the environment, about labor standards and so on. That's the price you pay. So Norway and the other European economic area countries, they get access to the single market, but they're not members so they have no say in the making of the regulation. They just take those regulations. Uh, and the UK government said, well, this is not good enough. We want to take back control. We're not going to be policy takers. So you go to the next one, the white cross on the red background, that's Switzerland. It's a little bit like the EEA, but you get uh, a little bit more of keeping your own rules and a bit less access. And then you get Ukraine, and then you get Turkey, which is in a customs union with the EU, but not in the single market. But if you're not prepared to accept those restrictions, if you're not prepared to accept the rules of the rules of the customs union or the single market, then all you can get is Canada. That is a basic trade deal, but you will have to meet European standards to send your goods there. Uh, and you won't have to accept European laws about the environment uh, and so on or labor standards, but then you won't get complete access to the single European market. That's the deal and that is uh, the trade-off. Well, the British government right from the beginning said, we want control, sovereignty is the main issue, our money, our laws and our borders. So Theresa May said that will mean no single market, no customs union and no jurisdiction for the Court of Justice of the European Union within the United Kingdom. And the EU said, fine, but in that case, you can't get complete access. Uh, you, you've got to accept the regulations if you're going to have access. Now, Theresa May, the last time I was talking to the alumni, Theresa May was caught in this dilemma and she couldn't get a compromise. She couldn't get a compromise that was acceptable to the European Union on the one hand and our own party and the Westminster Parliament on the other hand. She tried the Chequers deal, she tried, we'll have a common rule book, we'll have a kind of customs arrangement. And the EU said, no, you've got to make your mind up. 
and her own party said that her deal, which accepted some European rules, that wasn't good enough. Boris Johnson said, we want to take back control. So it's been all about sovereignty and all about taking back control. Finally, we have a little map there which shows the way, the final map about how people voted, who voted remain and who voting leave. As we know, uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to remain, London voted remain, the big cities voted remain, but most of England outside the cities voted to leave because that's where this concern with sovereignty uh, lies. Now, now, Chloe, I think we can turn off the slides now and I'll come back into the screen and carry on. Is that is that working now? Am I back on the screen? Yep, you're so. back on the screen. Great. OK, that's the fundamental uh, dilemma. Uh, there's no middle way, choice with sovereignty or free trade. The government went for sovereignty. It then managed after Boris Johnson became prime minister and after he won a majority in the election to negotiate a deal at the very, very last minute. You'll remember uh, th this happened over Christmas. I think it was New Year's Eve, uh, the, literally the last minute uh, to get some kind of arrangement so that we left the transition period uh, uh, and with a partnership called the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Now, initially, there was agreement by Theresa May and initially with Boris Johnson on what was called the political declaration, which said we will seek some kind of partnership with the European Union, what the EU calls an association, a close uh, association. That didn't happen. Uh, and what we've got is not a partnership, it's just a trade agreement. It's called the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, and that is really quite significant. It's not called a partnership and it's not called an association. It does provide for free trade in the sense that there are no tariffs on trade in goods. Trade in manufactured goods and agriculture will not be subject to tariffs. That does not mean there will be no customs arrangements. As we've seen in the last few weeks, there are customs arrangements because you've got to make sure that the goods qualify. There are things called rules of origin. There are VAT regulations. So there are customs uh, checks at the border which there were not before, but there is no tariff to pay. So that makes trade a lot less expensive than would have been the case had there been no deal, which there almost wasn't. There's nothing whatever on services. Services are about 80% of the British economy. They account for 40% of our exports to the EU are in services, financial services, but insurance and other kinds of services. There's nothing there uh, at all because the UK government said, we don't want to accept your rules. Uh, there are no tariffs on services anyway. The obstacles to trade in services is all about rules and regulation. Now, on the question of regulatory alignment, the big issue, apart from the fisheries issue, which has, of course, some uh, importance for the northeast of Scotland, we could back to, come back to that. But apart from the fisheries issue, the big obstacle towards the end of the negotiations was about the so-called level playing field or regulations. And the EU said, well, if you're going to have this free trade deal, then we've got to make sure that you're going to engage in fair trade. You won't give any subsidies to your producers. You will have a competition policy uh, that you will not try to undercut us by lowering your environmental standards or lowering labor regulations. We're going to have some safeguards before we give you this because you're so close and the volume of trade is so high and the British government said you've never done that in other trade deals but the Europeans said we've never done a trade deal with a country that's just on our doorstep that has previously been a member that's already in regulatory alignment so they have a very elaborate arrangement to try and constrain the way in which Britain could exercise its own regulations about the environment, about agricultural standards, uh, about labour standards, about all kinds of things. And they say that each side, the European Union and the UK, will make their own rules, they'll make their own regulations and they'll have their own competition policy, 
but they must be compatible in the sense that if they rules are such to distort trade, then either side can invoke an arbitration procedure and ultimately put sanctions on the other side. So although the UK has the right to make its own regulations and change its own regulations, if it does so, there could be a penalty. And specifically, if the United Kingdom should lower standards, regulatory standards in any field, the European Union has a right to impose tariffs and say, well, the deal's off. Uh, we're going to limit free trade in that sector or more generally because you haven't respected this level playing field. Or indeed, if in the future the EU said we're going to have higher standards on agriculture, on uh, animal welfare, the environment, or whatever, and the UK doesn't follow along with that, the EU can say well, we're going to have a, a review of this arrangement and in four years there'll be a review anyway. Now we've no idea how that's going to work out. You could say well the UK now has got control of its own laws, it's not subject to European laws, it's not subject to the European Law Court of Justice, but on the other hand you could say well if they don't stay pretty much in line with EU laws then they could be in trouble, they're going to lose market access or say if they sign a free trade deal with another country with the United States perhaps and the condition of that is you allow in American agricultural products at lower standards once again the EU can say look that is upsetting the level playing field that's why this deal is not finished yet that's why it's not worked out because all of that has got to be worked out uh, and there's also a question of whether there in the future will be any deal about services and particular financial services. So that's the deal and that's the ambivalence of the deal. There's been a lot of work done on the economic cost of Brexit. All the figures, and I include the government's, the UK government's own figures, shows that there will be a cost to Brexit. The cost of a no deal Brexit was really quite high, over 10% of GDP. It's reckoned that the cost of this deal is probably about a loss of five and a half percent of our exports and a loss of about four and a half percent of our GDP. That is, GDP will be four and a half percent lower than it otherwise would have done because we've lost, we will have lost a lot of our trade with Europe and we will not compensate that with trade deals with other countries. We'll recover a little bit of that, but there's no trade deal that could make up for trade with the European Union, which currently is over 40% of our total trade. Now, we don't know how that is working out, except that there have been a lot of teething problems. There's been a catastrophic fall in UK exports to the EU. In fact, they're down uh, not by 4%, but by about 40% since we left the transition period. Some of that has got with COVID. Some of that has got to do with companies stockpiling in advance of the end of the transition period. Some of it is because there are teething problems with the paperwork that's been done, the enormous amount of paperwork that's been done. But some of it is because small companies have just decided it's not worth exporting to Europe because of all the uh, bureaucracy that is involved and the cost of that. Uh, and the UK has not yet apply all of these deals, all of the conditions. So the UK has not yet imposed all the restrictions on imports from the EU because it's up to the UK to put those restrictions in place. But the EU has put in place the controls on exports from the UK to the EU. So we've lost a lot more by way of exports than the EU, the EU has lost. But that, that may be locked out, that may be sorted out in the meantime. We don't know. The other issue that I want to talk about is the effect of Brexit on the nations and on our devolution settlement and the position of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Because although the UK voted to leave the EU by 52%, divided in the way that we looked at earlier on, it was older people, uh, it was people without a university education, it was people in the small towns and 
the rural areas of, of England who voted, but overall it was 52%. But in Scotland, 62% voted to remain, which is very significant. That's much bigger than the leave majority anywhere across the UK. So what do we do about that? Now, the reasons for Scotland voting to remain were initially nothing to do with the independence issue because independence-minded people, nationalists and unionists in Scotland, both voted for Remain in more or less the same proportion. So this wasn't initially a nationalist vote. It was right across the political parties in support of all the parties voted for Remain more strongly than their counterparts in England. Uh, and this caused a dilemma for the present Scottish government of the SNP because they said, well, we can now have another independence referendum to stay in the EU, but 30% of their voters had voted to leave. And that has now changed. And since the referendum, there's been a move of people who voted no to independence, but yes to Europe. They're moving towards independence now. It's not a huge move, but it's enough to take it from 45% over the... And late last year showed it well over 50%, but it's probably around about 50-50. So there has been a shift towards independence as a result of the Brexit vote. How that's going to work out, we don't know. At the same time, the Scottish government and other parties in the Scottish Parliament, indeed, have tried to remain as close to Europe as possible, even if it's not possible to remain in Europe because Brexit is for the whole of the UK. So they tried to they, they introduce the Continuity Act, the Legal Continuity Act, which allows Scotland to maintain alignment with EU rules, even if the UK diverges. The UK government has rather undercut that by introducing the Internal Market Act that says that products made in England, Wales and Northern Ireland can be sold in Scotland irrespective of Scottish regulations. So Scotland can set the regulations but they may be uh, undermined. But the aspiration is to keep in line with UK uh, regulations. There's a very different attitude to migration in Scotland because all the parties in the Scottish Parliament want, wanted to keep freedom of movement. Uh, and the EU said, well, it, that's, that's part of the package. If you want the single market, you've got to have freedom of movement. But the UK wasn't going to accept that deal. Uh, and freedom of movement therefore ended uh, and this is a problem for Scotland, which has asked for some leeway here, but, but has not received it. Uh, things like the Erasmus programme, the Scottish Government and the Welsh Government wanted to stay in the Erasmus Student Exchange programme. The European Commission told them uh, they couldn't do that. So there is, there are various ways in which Scotland can try and stay closer to Europe, but, but it's not proved uh, easy at, at all, because neither the UK government nor the European Commission has facilitated that. Uh, and then various powers in fact, have been taken back to West, Westminster as a result of Brexit, and the money, the structural fund money, the regional spending that used to come to Scotland for Scotland to spend, uh, the Scottish government to spend, uh, has now been replaced by a fund controlled by the UK government without a Scottish government input. So there's been a certain rolling back of devolution. Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland voted to remain, but uh, by 56%. As always, there was a difference between the two communities. The nationalists voted by, to, to remain by almost 90%, practically unanimous, because they saw that Brexit would threaten the Good Friday Agreement and could threaten the open border that we have between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, the Unionists voted to leave by about 65%. So this opened up a breach once again between the two communities in Northern Ireland and raised the question of what to do about the Irish border because the combination of the Good Friday Agreement, the dismantling of security apparatus, together with the European single market, meant that there is no physical border in Ireland anymore. You can just drive right across there and the only thing you notice is that kilometers change into miles and vice versa when you're coming the other way. This was a huge achievement, uh, taking that issue effectively out of politics 
uh, and enabling the peace agreement to, to go ahead. To the point that uh, people have stopped talking about the border. Now that has come back in a big way because with the UK outside the EU and the Republic of Ireland inside, there's got to be a border. There's got to be a border somewhere. And either you leave, put a border back in between the two parts of Ireland, uh, or you bring the whole of Ireland together and you put a border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland or the border in the Irish Sea. That is inescapable. It's like Barnier's ladder. You've got to accept the consequences of this. There's got to be a border. The EU uh, and the UK single markets have to be bordered somewhere. After all, the Brexit people said they wanted to take back control of their borders. Uh, and the EU said we've got to maintain the integrity of the single market. That is, we can't have a, a hole in our borders and our customs and regulatory borders for things to come in. Hence the Irish Protocol. Now the Irish Protocol is a bit of a fudge. It says that Northern Ireland will adopt both European regulations and British regulations, uh, and it will be in the UK Customs Union and the European Customs Territory as well. And in order to achieve this, there's a very complicated set of arrangements whereby goods can come from Britain, they can go on the boat in Stranraer and come off uh, at Larne again, uh, but if they're destined to leave the uh, Northern Ireland and go into the Republic of Ireland, uh, then uh, entering the European single market, there will be controls. There won't be tariffs because we've got the free trade routes, but there will be controls and they will have to uh, respect the European regulations. Similarly, things coming the other way. Now, that Irish protocol has been extremely contentious. The unionists don't like it. The, the nationalists accept it. Uh, the, the, they support it as the next best thing. And the British government says that it doesn't mean there will be a border in the Irish Sea, but it is a, there is a border in the Irish Sea. And I've got a whole, technically a whole lot of quotes here from the two sides as to what they think the border means. Now, that is in deep trouble because that wasn't made clear. And as far as the Irish government and the Europeans were concerned, it meant Europe, the Northern Ireland adopting pretty much the whole of the rules of the UK, of the EU, sorry, single market. And the British government said, oh, no, it only means limited aspects, the minimum required to make the Good Friday Agreement work. And that's been present all along. So what does the border in the Irish Sea mean? We really don't know. Again, there's been a postponement of this coming into effect fully, but as we know, there's been a great deal of confusion as to exactly what the rules are here uh, and what the significance of that border is going to mean. Finally, of course, there's the question of England, which is uh, a particularly interesting one because England did vote to leave, not unanimously and with big regional variations. Uh, and what we found in the studies about why people in England voted. It was the sovereignty, it was the migration question, but it was also because they felt a strong sense of being English. And I was trying to explain this to some of my colleagues in Europe the other day. The people in England didn't vote for Brexit because they felt strongly British. It was because they felt strongly English. Uh, and English identity correlates very closely with support for Brexit. Uh, and support for a rather hard form of Brexit. So this sovereignty argument, taking back control, is all to do with England and uh, Englishness. Uh, the surveys have shown this. And they've also shown that a majority of Leave voters in England would accept the secession of both Scotland and Northern Ireland in order to achieve Brexit. So if there is a threat to the Union, it's not just in Scotland and in Northern Ireland, leaving the Union. It's in England as well, where English voters are not interested in the Union uh, if that gets in the way of Brexit. So that's where we are now. I hope to be able to tell you how all this would work out. Lots of loose ends, lots of things unresolved, lots of ambiguities in the trading relationship between the UK and the EU, and huge reverberations for the United Kingdom Union uh, itself.
Thanks. I think we've got some time for a discussion then. Thank you. I'm just popping my camera back on. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, that was incredibly fascinating. Um, and we will now uh, take any questions if anyone has them. So, like I said before, if you do have any questions, you can just put them in the bottom right of the screen. I feel like we probably will have a lot of questions. It's just waiting for someone to put in the first question and kick things off. Give it a minute or two. If we, I mean, if we don't have any questions, uh, we can wrap things up there, but there we go. <laughs> I was like, I feel like we will have questions. So um, yeah. our first one is from uh, Rachel. What next in relation to the Irish border? Yeah, good, a, 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 a good question. We, we, we really don't know the Irish well, let me say a little bit about this, this Irish protocol. The, the, the deal that Theresa May negotiated was called a backstop, and that said that pending a final trade agreement between the UK and the EU, we'd have this temporary border in the Irish Sea. Boris Johnson said that was totally unacceptable, but that's exactly what he signed up to. Uh, so it wasn't the, what was the backstop became the front stop. And so it's a permanent arrangement now that there will be checks between GB and Northern Ireland in order to be able to open the border to the EU and the trade deal did not resolve that problem because it was a very limited trade deal and so we've got the protocol. Now there is a provision in the protocol that it can be revisited after four years and the Northern Ireland Assembly can withdraw it but that would depend on the DUP getting a majority which is extremely so that it's with us. Uh, it's been causing a lot of problems because of the way in which it wasn't terribly well specified. Uh, we still don't know the scope of it. There may be legal cases. Uh, the, the, the things maybe go to arbitration to test the limits of it because the UK may say, well, we're going to allow more goods to go freely in Northern Ireland without, expect it, without having to uh, inspect them because these are small firms or who cares a little bit about animal regulations it doesn't really matter but the Europeans might say no we've got to enforce this very very strictly uh, uh, because it's a matter of, of principle so how much flexibility there will be uh, the Irish government would like to be flexible because uh, it wants to facilitate trade between Northern Ireland and, and Great Britain and across the borders of, of Ireland uh, it, it itself but once again, its, it's hands are, are, are tied. Uh, and then all of these things have can become very, very political. Uh, you could try and, and this is what the Europeans would like to do and the British government say, this is a purely technical matter. This is about expect, inspecting animal carcasses in the port of Larne and we'll leave it to the veterinary people. But anything in Northern Ireland can become highly politicized. So it takes one little incident and one little you know, and, and this is one reason why they wanted to avoid physical borders between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, because somebody would blow them up. Uh, and already there have been threats to customs facilities between GB and Northern Ireland. So it's a very, very volatile and very delicate situation. Uh, and it could explode at any time. Uh, it, it, it's hostage to the general tensions within, within Northern Ireland itself. So the hope is that things will calm down and people will say this is a, a, a technical matter but if the Northern Ireland settlement gets into trouble and already uh, we, we've had uh, loyalist paramilitaries uh, making threatening noises then this could become a flashpoint so potentially it's very very dangerous indeed. Thank you and our next question is um, does the vaccination success make people feel better about having left the EU? Um, we, 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 I, I, I can't answer that 
question because I don't I don't have data and I like to go on uh, hard data. Um, but certainly it's it, it, it's a factor. Uh, the initial handling of the uh, of, of the COVID crisis cost the government, the British government, a huge amount of political support and political capital because it was not perceived as being terribly uh, effective. The vaccination rollout has been uh, a success. Uh, and certainly that has meant that the Brexit people are trying to demonstrate that this is an effect of, of Brexit. Uh, this, this wouldn't have, if we'd stayed in the European Union, this wouldn't have happened. I, 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 I don't agree with that myself. I think it's to do with uh, other things completely, mainly to do with the success of the NHS in deploying the vaccine and the investment in the vaccine uh, that took place. Um, it's difficult to see how being in the EU would have stopped us doing what we did with the vaccine. Uh, I can't see anything in the European regulations that would have stopped us doing that. Uh, but of course, if the Europeans have further problems in deploying the vaccine, uh, at, at the moment, some European countries have suspended the AstraZeneca one. It wasn't the European Commission that did that, despite what the headlines were saying this morning. It was individual member states uh, that did that. Uh, this doesn't, none of this helps the relationship between the UK uh, and, and the EU. Uh, and there have been some blunders there. The EU blundered in trying to stop the movements of vaccine across the Irish border. This was in breach of the uh, agreement. So it just takes little things like that, uh, like, like that particular one where the EU backed off in, within three hours to inflame what is already a very difficult position. So yes, this vaccine nationalism could, could make relationships more difficult and therefore make it more difficult for a calm uh, addressing of, of, of some of these issues. But the vaccine thing in itself, I, I, I don't think will prove to be uh, a great barrier because Europe might be vaccinated a couple of months later than the UK. But if you look at the world picture, they're actually pretty close together, well ahead of, that of most other parts of the world. Thank you. Um, our next question is about the fisheries. So can you say a little bit more about the fisheries issue? Is that mainly affecting the northeast of Scotland or all of Scotland's fisheries? Well, it's affecting fisheries throughout the UK. Now, the shellfish industry has been particularly affected by it because of their production chains and the need to get their produce to market very, very quickly. And this was, this was always the case. Uh, and I was talking to people in the fisheries industry up in the Northeast and I, and I went to Shetland as well during the campaign. And there was awareness of this, that uh, in the fishing industry, people wanted to take control of the fishing grounds around Scotland, but they were also aware that they export about 80% of their catch to Europe. And that requires access to the European single market. Now, we've got a trade deal, so there are no tariffs on fish, uh, but there are other kinds of regulatory controls and form filling, which has proved extremely difficult. So uh, the, 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 the fishing industry has found it extremely problematic. They may lose markets altogether, uh, and certainly their costs have been increased as a result of this. Not so much over the catching issue, but over the, over the marketing of the fish. Uh, selling of, of, of the fish. Thank you. Um, our next one is from Morna and Peter, who say that was excellent. What do you see happening next? Um, Lord Frost extending the grace period um, and the EU response. It, it, it depends on the the atmosphere and, and the political relationships. Uh, and things were not facilitated by the UK saying everything is to do with sovereignty because people in Europe don't really understand that. And you, 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 any, any trade deal involves the surrender of some control. That's, that's what a deal means. Uh, and on the EU side, uh, there was this insistence on the integrity of the single market and perhaps a rather dogmatic insistence. Well, absolutely, this must be maintained as, as, as a complete whole, particularly in the face of a leaving country. Uh, they've had more flexible arrangements with third countries, the country who wants to leave. 
So those red lines on both sides were, were, were pretty strict and this didn't facilitate things. This having happened, Brexit having occurred, many people had hoped that they, both sides could relax and be a little bit more flexible about it, but that doesn't seem to have been the case. Uh, we know that David Frost is a very hard Brexiter and, and we know that on the EU side, similarly, they're taking a very tough position uh, about this. Uh, so that we haven't seen in the aftermath of Brexit uh, an awful lot of compromises. And this, of course, will, will, it will increase the cost. And, and then, there, as I said, there are so many things to be negotiated. There's services, there's sorting out the fisheries, there's regulatory standards, uh, there's animal standards. Uh, all, all of these things have yet to be worked out in practice. So I see a lot of friction and a lot of tension. Uh, and these things can easily be politicized and become the matters for, for conflict. So I, I, I'm not optimistic about this relationship settling down in the near future. Thank you. And uh, our next question is, what is the situation with the Commonwealth regarding trade? Well, there isn't a Commonwealth trade dimension. There used to be when you had Imperial and Commonwealth preference, but, but there is no Commonwealth trade policy. It's all up to individual Commonwealth countries. Now, the UK is getting a trade deal with Canada, but it's just the EU trade deal rolled over. Uh, and uh, there's proposal to get a trade deal with Australia, but the U EU will get a trade deal with, with Australia as well. Since the EU is, has, is more powerful, they'll probably get a better deal, trade deal with Australia uh, than we do. Let's talk about a trade deal with uh, India. Uh, India will want uh, as a quid pro quo, a relaxation of, of, of visa requirements. A lot of Indian people want to come and work here. India will be looking for that. Uh, they've already made it clear that that will be part of the deal with India. So whoever you make trade deals with, there's going to be a trade off. You're going to have to give something in return. So rather than talking about the Commonwealth, you can talk about North America, that's Canada and the United States, that's the Pacific, there's Asia and so on. These are all very different markets and they all have to be negotiated separately. Thank you. And our next one um, is outside of trade. What are the implications for security cooperation? Oh, that, that's, that's, that, 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 that's a good one, uh, because there was a chapter in the negotiations about security cooperation. It didn't really go very far because the UK wanted to restrict the negotiations just to trade. Uh, when we were going to have a wide association agreement, there was going to be a strong security dimension. There are some elements in it, but there are some elements that have lost. Uh, for example, two, 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 two elements of security, of course, there's the military and there's the internal security policing matters. We, we've lost access to the European uh, arrest warrant. We've lost access to some databases. Uh, all of those would have to be renegotiated if we want to be part of that. But we've not lost all cooperation on security matters because neither side wanted that. Uh, as far as military security is concerned, uh, in fact, there's quite a lot of cooperation. Some of it was the EU, some of it the individual EU countries, and of course, through NATO, because most EU countries are in NATO, we're still part of the North Atlantic uh, Alliance. So most of the existing security apparatus will stay in place. But then that depends on what the UK wants to do with regard to security, because they've now decided that they want to resume a presence east of Suez. They're sending this deployment out to the Indian Ocean and the China Seas in a few weeks' time. As they've built these aircraft carriers, they want to be a global power again. Uh, that's a strategic tilt away from where the UK has been for the last 50 years, which is very much part of Europe focusing on the transatlantic islands on the one hand and on Europe on the other hand. So yes, there'll be a lot of ad hoc cooperation on security, but the EU will develop its own security policy with the UK as a partner in that, but not as part of it, not as a member of that. I'm very unclear about where the UK wants to be in 
as in matters of security these days because we're not a great power we're not a superpower but we're not a minor power either and, and um, I, I haven't read this new review that just came out today that's an attempt to try and reposition uh, the, the UK as some kind of military power post the post Brexit but I think the, the, the UK having coming out of the EU the EU will come together the EU will use this opportunity to become more united uh, in, in foreign policy matters and in security matters in the absence of the UK because the UK was always a reluctant partner in that. Thank you. Our next question is from Amanda who says um, that was so interesting especially the last point about English sovereignty um, that's presumably um, class and education related too. Sorry, sorry. Um, so the last, the, she's just commenting on how um, the last point, uh, she found that interesting about English sovereignty and I guess the feelings that were associated with that and she's asking, um, you know, were they presumably like class and education related as well? Yes, so, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, 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 we've got to be careful not to exaggerate this, but there's uh, a lot of work now coming out about English public opinion and the way in which Brexit and feeling English uh, and some of these cultural issues tend to come together. Uh, we don't want to be stereotypical about the English Brexit voter because it's, it's much more complex, but there is that cluster of, of socially conservative people in left behind towns in, in England who are very strongly feeling English, rather opposed to migration uh, and, and, and Eurosceptic. And also they tend to be in favor of projecting British power. They see there's an imperial nostalgia there. Uh, so th that is an important element. Now that, that exists in Scotland as well, uh, but, it, but it's, just, it's not as great. Uh, and there's nothing in Scotland equivalent to that English identification because if you feel more Scottish in Scotland, you tend to feel more pro-European rather than less because of the way that's been constructed. And similarly in Wales and, and in Northern Ireland too. So, that's something that really is peculiar to the way that this thing has worked out in English, in, in England. And of course, in England, there's always an ambiguity between Britishness and Englishness. They, they, they don't always make that distinction. But when you do put it to them, and the surveys do now do, do you feel English or British? It's those ones who said we feel English that want to keep British sovereignty most strongly. Thank you. Our next question is from Rosella, who also says, um, thank you very much. This is extremely useful. Would there be a possibility that Britain rejoins the EU in the future? Yes, uh, there, there, there could be. That might depend on how the EU develops, because at the moment there's a pretty strict distinction between being in the EU and being outside the EU. The only exceptions to that are these EEA countries, just Norway, uh, Iceland and, and Liechtenstein and then, and then Switzerland, which, which are small countries that try to be halfway in and halfway out. Uh, but maybe as the EU struggles to deal with its other neighbours in the Balkans, say, are all those countries going to come in or Ukraine or Georgia, they're not going to join the EU but they're going to be within the EU orbit. So there's a possibility you may get a more differentiated Europe with an inner core countries that are in the Euro, they're in all the European policies, an outer core of countries that are maybe won't join the Euro, maybe some of the Central European countries, but they're in the EU, and then another tier of countries in the EA, the Norway, Switzerland, and then beyond that, another tier of countries. So maybe the UK would find itself in, in, in that kind of relationship somewhere in there, having a relationship to the EU without being uh, within it. But that depends on the way that, that, that Europe develops. So far, they've tended to insist on you're either in or you're out. And there's only, the, the only halfway house is for these very small countries that have managed to make an exception to the rule. Thank you. Our next question kind of is on a similar vein. Um, what is the possibility of another British government re-entering the customs union and even the single market? Well, that's not going to happen in, in, a, in a one -hour. I don't think any British government is going to say, oh, we were wrong. Let's join the single market 
uh, and or the customs union. Uh, they, they, there's no other country that's actually in the single market and the customs union together. Norway is in the single market and Turkey is in the customs union, but no country is in both of them. Uh, but what might happen is this could occur by stealth. Supposing the UK interprets the new rules about regulatory alignment to say, oh, we'll just stick with European rules, uh, effectively. Or, or if the industry, the car industry says, we're going to follow European rules anyway. We don't accept, we don't care what the British government says. Uh, we're going to have our own rules. So maybe de facto, the UK will become part of the single market because it's the only way you can do trade without accepting it as a, as a, as a matter of law. Um, the customs union, well, if you've got free trade and no tariffs, you're halfway there already. So that's, that's one scenario. The UK, without actually proclaiming it, eases itself back into the European economic space. And the other scenario is it moves in the other direction, insisting on its sovereignty and saying we're not going to cede an inch of sovereignty and therefore we're not going to get closer to Europe. This is why I'm saying this issue is not resolved. What we got in the deal was, was a compromise that's going to be worked out in practice. And maybe a future UK government would say, well, the issue has gone off the boil now, we can get away with creeping closer to the uh, EU, or, or maybe they couldn't. We just, we just don't know. That's, that's for the future. Thank you. Um, our next question is, will Brexit really be over until Scotland, Northern Ireland and England go their separate ways? Yes, that's one scenario that Scotland becomes independent in the EU, Ireland reunifies. Let's leave Wales aside for a minute. Though there is an independence movement in Wales at the moment, but let's say England and Wales then become independent by default because everybody else is class. It looks terribly neat, uh, but in fact, it's much more complicated than that because uh, for Scotland to become independent, we'd have to have an independence majority, and it's about 50 50 at the moment. So that's one thing. There's also the fact that, that Scotland does most of its trade with the rest of the UK, more than with the European Union. And if Scotland were in the EU and England were outside the EU, you'd have that hard border between Scotland and England, the Northern Ireland problem all over again. This, this wouldn't make matters simple. I mean, if England were to get closer to the EU, that would help matters and the trade deal helps matters, but there would certainly be economic disruption. And as far as Northern Ireland is concerned, there has been a movement back to supporting Irish unity amongst nationalist voters. Now, nationalist voters, had the majority or the largest number had stopped supporting Irish unity because they had the Good Friday Agreement and the open border. And that was their preference. That's changed. They've gone back to supporting Irish unity. But it's not affected opinion amongst Protestants and unionists at all. On the contrary, they've not moved that direction. Uh, and people in Ireland now generally accept that for Ireland to reunify, it would require not just a simple majority, but a substantial degree of consent amongst the unionist community. They couldn't be coerced. There's got to be some kind of agreement. Uh, and this is what we had before Brexit, because within the European framework, you could have that open border uh, and both sides could have a territorial imagination. The unionists could say, we're happy because we have a connection to Great Britain and the nationalists could say we're happy because we have an open border to the south. That's no longer uh, uh, available, but there's no alternative to it because either, side, either thing is going to make people very unhappy. You can't close the Irish border because the Good Friday Agreement is part of an international agreement. On the other hand, closing or establishing this border in the Irish Sea uh, is, is, is a violation of understandings that were made to the unionists, that they would have free access to the United Kingdom. In other words, the situation in Northern Ireland is a bit of a mess, and there's no obvious way uh, out of it, other than trying to relax tensions. Now, insofar as the whole of the UK drifts back into the European orbit, the scenario I was talking about a few minutes ago, then Scotland, Northern Ireland and England might find it easier to uh, manage their mutual relationships 
but if the but if it doesn't, if the UK insists on continues to insist on a hard Brexit, then that's going to make that matter easy. Now, I, I think I ended up last time. I usually do um, by by saying that uh, all these scenarios are impossible. <laughs> The UK staying together, impossible. The UK falling apart, it's impossible. Uh, but then something is going to happen. So somebody said to me, so the impossible is going to happen. <laughs> uh, we, just, we just don't know. All we can say is these are tension points all over the place. There are multiple points of tension here that could easily break. Um, and I can't predict how it's going to go. But uh, certainly the, the question I was asked here was about Irish unification. That is really a tricky one, and there are very few people in the South that want it to happen in the short run. In the long run, yes, uh, but the Irish government is really very unhappy about talk of unification because it doesn't know how it would deal with the, the North uh, on its own. It really wouldn't. It would, it would be profoundly disrupting to the Irish state itself. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Claire. Um, why do you think there was such a push from the right a hard Brexit, given the difficulties it would clearly cause for trade and for the union? Well, it is in that little graph I showed you right at the beginning, whether you think it's about sovereignty or, or whether you think it's about economics, that, 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 that is the trade-off. And very few people said that Brexit would bring economic gains. The pro-Brexit people would try to minimize the losses and they said, oh, we'll recoup those losses eventually by signing free trade deals with the United States and, and other countries. But nobody really said that it was going to be costless. The question is, is, is it worth paying that cost? Now, that's a legitimate question in a democracy. If you want to bring back sovereignty, there's a cost uh, attached to it. But that, that, that was the argument. And what was extraordinary following the saga was the way that the Conservative Party was taken over by that argument and the pro-business way of the Conservative Party was marginalized and we saw that with the expulsion of the MPs when Boris Johnson came in and the falling out with the with the Treasury. Uh, so the Treasury, the Bank of England, uh, the CBI, th these had really no influence which is really which is which is truly surprising because it was all it was all about sovereignty. Uh, that wasn't the way to begin with. That wasn't Theresa May's view. Theresa May's view was to try and balance the economics with the sovereignty considerations. But with Johnson, the sovereignty considerations prevailed. And that's encapsulated in the figure of, of David Frost. Uh, that, that this is about sovereignty. This is an issue of principle. And uh, it's, it's not primarily about, about economics. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Marion. Does the UK leaving the EU threaten the future of that very institution? No, it doesn't. It, it, it's, prof it, it, it's very difficult for the EU to cope with this because it's a loss to its prestige if one of its larger members decides to leave. And there was a flurry of interest in this in various places, including momentarily Ireland. Uh, I say momentarily because it lasted just, just a few weeks. I was in Ireland at, at the time. Well, maybe we should go as well and, 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 and join the Brits. Uh, and that lasted a very short period because another reaction played in at that point, which was much more powerful, which was, well, this just shows us what could happen. This shows us the danger we face here, uh, that the whole of the EU could fall apart. Uh, and that renewed the determination of the EU countries to stay together. And that is one reason they took such a tough line with the Brits, because they wanted to show that leaving the European Union would have a cost. Otherwise, everybody would want to cherry pick, everybody would want to leave the EU and say, we want to keep all the benefits from it. There's also been a dramatic turnaround in public opinion in practically every European country. Support for the EU in, increased. Now, they needed that because the European project was in trouble because of austerity, the euro crisis and uh, the migration crisis. The EU is in deep trouble. 
And in some ways, Brexit has done them a favor because it's increased support for the European project. So that even people like the, uh, the French Rassemblement uh, National or the Lega in Italy, who are very Eurosceptical, they're now saying, no, we, we don't want to leave. We want to change Europe, but we don't want to leave. So there's really no significant strain of opinion in the EU that actually wants to leave the European Union. They want to change it. They're Eurosceptic. They blame Europe for everything. But there's been no imitation effect of the Brits, of parties in other countries, Eurosceptic parties saying we actually want to leave. Quite the contrary. Thank you. Um, our next question, is there any evidence for knowledge and appreciation of what the EU is and, and does, um, has like grown amongst the UK population since the beginning of the Brexit issue? Well, there was, because it wasn't just in the EU that there was a rallying support following the Brexit referendum. There was in the UK, because the 52% majority for leave right across the UK, taking the UK as a whole, was taken as a mandate to leave the EU and the single market and the customs union and absolutely everything, although that was not what was on the ballot paper. Uh, and so the pro-European did rally, people rallied. And, and for a while, the UK used to have the largest and most active pro-European movement anywhere in Europe. So there was right here in the UK because the 48% uh, rallied around the theme of well, we, we, we want to stop this, we want a second referendum or whatever. They totally failed to mobilize. They totally failed to make their case. They were fragmented. The Labour Party was all over the place. And so that, that movement was lost, really. Uh, and now we have the Labour Party and even the Liberal Democrats saying we don't want to raise the issue again. Uh, so there was a moment when there could have been, if not a reversal of Brexit, a different kind of Brexit or a softer Brexit. Uh, that moment was lost through a lot of miscalculations and bad tactics by the pro-Europeans. And now we are where, where, where we are. And if the European movement in the UK is going to get going again in the future, it will really have to start from scratch. Bearing in mind the figures we saw earlier on, that a huge majority of young people did vote to remain and, and, and are still pro-Remain, are still pro-European. Thank you. And potentially our last question, um, what next for the SNP? Uh, losing powers to Westminster as a devolved government, um, independent support, not reaching breakthrough levels. What does the road ahead look like for the SNP? Ooh, uh, <laughs> this is a question I've asked several times a week. <laughs> I'm a political scientist. I'm not a fortune teller. Uh, we know that the SNP has been uh, extraordinarily successful and um, leading in the polls after 14 years in government is highly uh, un unusual. We know why that is, because they've taken over significant sections of the population. They, they, they've colonized large parts of what were the former Labour vote. Uh, they've taken over the pro-European wing. Some work that we did recently confirmed this polarization between, on the one hand, people are in favor of independence and, and, and in favor of Europe, both of those together, that's about 50%. And then, and they vote SNP. They didn't, a lot of pro-independence people used to vote Labour, they vote SNP. And on the other hand, you have those people who don't want to hear about a, a referendum even, in other words, very strict, stern unionists uh, and pro-Brexit, and they're about 25% and they vote Conservative. And that is what the opinion polls have been showing for the last few years. The SNP is running around about 50%, maybe a little less, and the Conservatives are running about 25%. And the Labour Party is caught between the two. Uh, their electorate is, 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 is all over the place on these, which explains why the SNP is winning and Conservatives are, 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 have been running at, at second. But neither is a convincing majority. Uh, SNP has not got a convincing majority for uh, independence in, in in Europe. So what will happen, we, we just don't know. Uh, the reason why, I, I, I also I should say, being telling the media for the last month, I'm not going to go anywhere near Salmon Sturgeon, <laughs> and I'm still not going to. Uh, but now, irrespective of those short-term things, uh, the SNP vote seems remarkably solid. 
But that's why, because it, that it's this pro-independence, pro-European combination. And, and the pro-independence Brexiters have, have, have mainly gone to the Tories. But it doesn't give a, a national consensus uh, for anything, whatever. Now, this will be tested after May. There's neither a pro-independence majority as there's not. If there's not a pro-independence majority, that's SNP and Greens. There won't be a referendum. If there is, then we'll have a constitutional conflict of whether there should be another independence referendum. Even if there is another independence referendum, it may or not be, be won. What has disappeared in Scotland is the middle ground. Uh, we were talking before Brexit, well, there's independence light. Uh, that is, we'll still be, we'll all be in the EU, and we'll have the monarchy and the pound, or, or there's Devo Max, and, and these, these, these were all middle ground ideas, and there was some coming together of the parties. They, they disagreed about independence, but they weren't that far apart. So that middle ground has disappeared, because either you're in the EU or you're not. You're independent or you're not. You have the pound or you don't have the pound. And that is reflected in, in, in public opinion. So the most significant thing really is the disappearance of these middle ground options. I know the Labour Party's talking about federalism, but I've no idea what they mean by it. I don't think they know what they mean by it either, because that middle ground is gone. Similarly, in Northern Ireland, that middle ground has been undermined uh, by Brexit. So I'm not answering the questions much about the SNP, but that's the, that's the layout of Scottish politics at, at, at the moment, uh, a high degree of political polarization and no clear national consensus uh, for any particular strategy. Thank you. Um, we'll wait a minute just to see if we have any more questions. Uh, that might be the, the last one that we have. Um, and if it is, uh, thank you, because I think it's an incredibly complicated uh, situation and you're incredibly knowledgeable about it. Uh, oh, we do have one more. Uh, I appreciate yeah. that you are not a fortune teller and you may not want to answer a counterfactual question, but what do you think would have happened with Brexit if Scotland had voted to leave the UK in 2014? Would the fallout have meant a Brexit referendum was not feasible? Well, if Scotland become independent, well, yeah, I, there, there wouldn't have been a... a there, there wouldn't have been a... Brexit referendum in Scotland, of course. Scotland would still be you know, trying, to, trying to get into the EU. That, that would have been a complex process rather than getting out. Uh, there would for sure have been a Brexit referendum in the rest of the UK. Uh, and, and presumably the Leave side would have won because the, the imperative to keep the union together would, would no longer have been, been present. So this would have really reinforced that. English Brexit sentiment. Uh, it would have meant, though, that uh, we, we would have had uh, the Scottish border problem. So in Scotland were in the EU and England and Wales were in the EU. They, they withdrew. Then we, we, we would have had the border question. Uh, and since uh, that, that wouldn't have been what people voted for in 2014, they voted for independence in Europe. But subsequently, that would have been cut from under their feet. So that would have caused all kinds of problems. But it's not something that Scotland could have done anything about, because that would have been a decision by England and Wales to, to withdraw, uh, and a hard border would have been the consequence of it. Obviously, in 2014, when everybody thought that we'd all be in the EU, independence looked a lot easier than it does now when it means that there would be that EU border. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. In your opinion, has anything good come out of Brexit? <sighs> well, there was a need to have a debate about, about, about Europe. The, you, you, Europe relied on this uh, elite consensus. And I don't mean it was a conspiracy and the people weren't in, in, involved, but there was a really a failure to engage people in, in the European project or to, to think about the implications of the European project uh, and to accept the fact that Europe does entail a, a loss of sovereignty. British governments always insisted we're in Europe but we haven't lost our sovereignty. This was untrue. The, the, we had lost sovereignty by going into Europe. Many people would think that's a good thing. That's the whole idea. 
is, is to share sovereignty. So you could say that issue really had that debate had to, had to take place and, and, and it did whether you think that brexit was the right outcome of that is, is, is another matter but that debate had to take place and, and it's certainly been a wake-up call to the rest of europe as, as well because there's a lot of complacency there about the european project and a failure for the uh, to take people with them so what is demonstrated is the need for politicians to take people with them if they're undertaking these kinds of projects Thank you. Um, just waiting a second just to see if another question pops in. We did have a comment saying that that was a good question, the last one. So, um, but if not, that might be a kind of good point to wrap things up for this evening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for the fascinating presentation and for all of the questions that you've answered as well. Um, lots of well, yeah, we're just beginning to get messages saying thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and insights. Um, I'm sure we'll continue to get more messages uh, uttering those words as well. So, yeah, thank you again. Um, and thanks so much to everyone for joining us. Uh, thank you to Mervyn as well for his introduction. And thanks to Nicole and Rebecca for helping this evening. And thank you to everyone for joining us. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening or um, afternoon. I saw that we're being joined by someone from the States. So uh, enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully we'll see some of you at another event soon. Thank you.